I'm very happy to welcome you on this day, and uh, which is organized in the framework of the cross-border project between uh, École Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture Paysage de Lille, University of Kent, and uh, Catholic University of Leuven, uh, which is financed by iSight uh, Lille Nord Europe. Uh, so normally, this should be uh, have, it should have been a face-to-face -face meeting in Canterbury. But uh, as you all know, uh, due to the pandemic situation, it was not possible. So we went online. Um, I will just uh, say a few words about how the project was born. Um, so it was born as a common response to call for a cross-border project on summer 2021, uh, because this re-involved uh, institutions come from countries or region regions that uh, were highly marked uh, by mining activities in the past. Uh, so project is aimed to bring together research teams uh, aimed to work together and share the knowledge and experience in order to develop methods that are aimed to improve our territories in situations that combine uh, architectural and heritage quality, urban regeneration, social fragility, and uh, many others. So this day is aimed to bring together the research groups uh, from these three institutions. And so everyone will present a little bit uh, its um, research topics and uh, see how they can be mo mobilized on the post-mining uh, territories. Uh, so in this framework of this project, we will also have two other meetings, uh, one in the Leuven, in Belgium, uh, approximately in February hoping that the pandemic situation will allow us to go to Belgium. And in another one, the final one in the March, in the territory of uh, Mining Basin, or in Lille, should be defined uh, later. Uh, so uh, today you will have several presentations from each institution. Uh, each presentation will last approximately 20 minutes. And afterwards, we will have uh, 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers. Uh, in the middle of the morning, we will have a small break. And we will close the day with a discussion on the European uh, funding possibilities. So I invite everyone to uh, active participation. And we also have a chat on Zoom, so you can uh, ask your questions on chat. Uh, this day is also open to other members of uh, Post Mining Network. Uh, so probably someone else uh, will join us during the morning. And uh, yeah, I wish this day will be interesting for everyone and will bring a lot of insight of the post mining uh, topics. Good. Okay, so uh, I think we can start directly with Martin Gaysen and his uh, presentation on uh, contested urban territories. Uh, so, Martin, please, when you're ready, you can share your screen with us and uh, start. All right. Thank you, Margarita. Um, before I start, just this, um, I actually met Beatrice in uh, Venice, mid of November, <laughs> and she mentioned about the project. She also mentioned that uh, two of my colleagues uh, are involved in this project, actually, Bruno de Mulder and, uh, and Kelly Shannon from the University of Leuven. Uh, but Bruno recently became the head of the department, which is a... Uh, yeah, overtaking his agenda. So that's um, why he's not present here. Uh, and that's why I'm like stepping into the project. Uh, Bruno and Kelly have worked in the past on the mining sites in the north of Belgium, in the Limburg area. Uh, I know their work, um, but from my side, I'm most, most of the time working in Southwest Flanders, which is a region that is close to the to the French border, which is actually very close to, to Lille. Uh, so my area of interest is, is actually there. But there are a lot of similar topics, a lot of things that uh, are uh, also present there as well. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So because you need to. I think Beatrice should. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, and there's also one thing you also need to know about the University of Leuven. Uh, although it's named University of Leuven, it has 13 campuses around the country. Uh, and I'm actually based in the city of Ghent, so the University of Leuven in the campus in Ghent. Um, also, this is sometimes confusing for people outside of the university that uh, we have this multi-campus model. So I uh, brought a bit together my work to uh, start a discussion. Um, actually, I uh, 
have been teaching already a long time at the uh, at university since 2006. Um, at a 15% uh, position as a, yeah, it's called a practice assistant in a university. So I was teaching in the, the studio environment, in the design studio environment. In uh, 14, 15, I started a PhD, finished it in 2020. And since this year, I became professor. So I'm still like young in the business, <laughs> in the professor business, and I'm still finding my way. Um, the area of interest, uh, the, the topic I'm working on is uh, uh, this kind of context, uh, what you see on the image, the historical image. It's a very small, tiny village of 1,000 inhabitants somewhere in the southwest of Flanders. Um, I also do need to mention that uh, besides academia, uh, which is a 50% position, I'm also working uh, as a practitioner. And um, what you see on the image is the, the city of Kortrijk on, in the southwest of Flanders, really close to Lille. I think there's only like 30 km kilometers of distance with, uh, with Lille. But what happened here is that the European, uh, in the, on the level of Europe, it was decided to uh, connect the harbors of Antwerp with uh, the Seine uh, region uh, by waterway. This was a decision made in the 1960s. And um, to make this possible, the waterway needs to be broadened, straightened, uh, enlarged, and so on for, larges, for larger boats. But on the local scale, this has an impact because all the bridges that you see on the image needed to be uh, replaced. The river needs to be uh, needed to be uh, rebuilt, actually. So there was an expropriation of more than two kilometers along the, the water. And during more than 15 years, the whole K structure, the whole uh, side of the water has actually been uh, has actually been redone. Um, my role in this kind of project is most of the time to act to act or to intervene as a kind of uh, intermediate between the local governments, which is the, the city of Kortrijk in this case, and the, the, the Flemish government. And uh, my role is most of the time uh, transforming an infrastructural project, uh, which is rather technical, into a city development project. And so in this case, I was able to design a series of parks, the case along the water, uh, but also a reflection on the on the whole development of the of the neighboring uh, of the neighboring areas. Um, yeah, and in, in the end, um, yeah, we were able to generate these kind of, uh, of spaces along the along the water. So that's about my uh, my practice. Now I will dive into the academic part. Um, well, actually, it's combined. So, <laughs> but lear learning from these projects, learning from these uh, waterway things, uh, I also learned that there is a kind of yeah consent. Well, it's not a consensus, but there is a kind of common approach on how we deal with uh, with city making. And I think you all know this kind of uh, literature. It actually describes a lot on how cities are made, how to deal with them. There are actually like guidelines, checklists on uh, what is place making, what is city making, and so on and so on. But in fact, uh, my context I'm working in is a, is a lot of this. Uh, also in Flanders, we are known as a very dispersed area, dispersed urban territory. And uh, we do notice that um, more than half of the Flemish inhabitants are living in this kind of context. A context that is not city, not land, it's something in between. And actually with my colleagues, we started to call this context uh, all city or lands because it combines features of both. What you see on the picture is uh, you have this historical hamlets, uh, we see some pieces of nature, we see energy uh, distribution, we see agriculture, we see natural reserves, and so on and so on. And they're like all intermingled one with the other. Um, they're all mixed one with the other, and that's why this idea of all city or land has, a, has, a, has arised. Um, looking at it from the from the satellite, I mean, the, the blue is the, the build-up area. Uh, and of course, in, in Flanders, we have like these more dense uh, urban areas, the, the, the bigger cities like Ghent, Antwerp, Brussels, maybe even Leuven is, uh, can be included in it. But in between, you see there's a nebula of, uh, of build, uh, build-up tissue, a nebula that is uh, yeah, very small scaled, extremely diff diffused. Uh, and on which a lot of negative qualities also have been uh, have been addressed to. Um, in the Flemish government at this point, there is a tendency to uh, to strengthen the urban areas, the traditional urban areas, and actually to uh, try to uh, get rid of the, the, the nebula that is in between. But I'm opposing a bit this, uh, this position, this discourse. It means that uh, the reality, and that's the same uh, place as the, the, the starting picture, it means that my, my reality or the, the, the field of research, the field I'm working in, is this kind of, uh, of context. And it's a context in which all these larger this uh, theoretical frameworks of, of scale and this theoretical frameworks of uh, placemaking and so on are actually not applicable at all. Um, the whole idea of uh, making places out of this with events or uh, redesigning them as public spaces, as places for meeting and so on and so on, is actually not, uh, not functioning at all in this kind of context because the, 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 the conditions of this context are extremely different than the traditional urban, uh, urban cities. 
Um, I've put in this slide because uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not alone with the with the, the point of view that uh, these kind of areas, these kind of contexts also have qualities and also have uh, have an interest of research. I've put in this slide by uh, by Seki Vigano because in, uh, in 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 his lecture Seki referred to this context as a as a kind of new type of city, the city of the 21st century. And uh, in the statement he made, he actually addressed Paris as a 17th or 18th century city, London as the 19th century city, the rural areas the 20, 21st century, and, and then the Brussels northwestern metropolitan area he started to call this, uh, was actually for him the new type of city to be uh, to be constructed. And I think here it is also quite clear that the geograph geographical proximity, um, I mean, I'm working in this, this nebula just below the word Brussels, and the Bassin Minier, Minier they're actually quite uh, quite in the proximity one uh, one of the other, and they are sharing a lot of similar uh, similar interests, this kind of similar topics as well. Um, I distilled for this presentation like five research lines. I'm going to dive into them uh, in detail. Uh, again, I'm at the start of my professorship, so I'm like uh, wandering off at this point. I'm like <laughs> very broad in my interests. Uh, this will focus in, in the upcoming years. Um, the first thing I'm working on is what I call like tools for togetherness. And uh, this has to deal with the, the fact that they observe in uh, a lot of these uh, small hamlets uh, a very similar approach on how we deal with public spaces. There seems to be a kind of a um, uh, similar agenda for all these places in which we, or, or the design and the government use natural, uh, natural cobblestone for the pavement, the same urban furniture, making these spaces pedestrian free and so on and so on. Um, but when going there, uh, when observing these places, uh, it's, it's very striking that they are actually hardly used. There is actually like nobody present. And one could, of course, argue that uh, it was a rainy day or a winter day and so on and so on. But in reality, I uh, made a, also an interview with more than 150 inhabitants asking them what is the importance of these kind of places? Do you go there? Where do you see your friends and so on and so on? And in fact, uh, they always pointed out or they pointed out these kind of areas. Um, started to call them collective destinations. These are like places where you have different qualities. These are not what we tend to see as like the pre-ordered public spaces. These are like places that, that occur in this nebula, uh, in this whole city or land context. And actually with my students, I worked on the, this whole question of what are these collective destinations? And perhaps these, these places or these, what I started to call tools for togetherness, uh, maybe they are linked to, the, to, larger, uh, to larger questions. Maybe they, they can be the kind of outcome of a, a question that taps upon ecological urgencies or that taps on mobility urgencies. And in this design, students actually made like a kind of a ecological mesh, uh, kind of ecological network, uh, and they combined it with a mobility network and they combined it with this kind of small uh, points in the landscape uh, with the whole scenography behind it. But I'm not going to elaborate this in a 20-minute presentation. Um, the second thing I'm doing is a, a project uh, called Espace Bleu, uh, the blue space. Um, this is actually a project with a, a lot of partners. Um, it is, uh, um, it's taking place in what, what is called the territory of the Euro Metropole, the Euro Metropolis. That's actually um, a collaboration between the north of France, uh, Wallonie Picardy, and the southwest of Flanders. Um, it is uh, supported by more than 14 um, government structures, going from the national states to the small local, uh, yeah, we call it intercommunale. Um, the Mel is also one of these kind of uh, structures. And uh, what we did there is, it's actually, it's already a long running project. Uh, we started in 2015, 16 on uh, questioning what is actually the thing that links us? Uh, what is actually the one element that goes over all these borders? And that is actually the, the, the one thing that uh, unites uh, these three territories. And uh, we came up with the fact that well, one of these things that we find as, a, as, a, as an element that federates is actually the water. Uh, the water simply runs across all these three territories and actually links us. Um, since 2016, there has been a reflection on uh, the rivers, the creeks, and the uh, groundwater table, um, how they are affecting this territory, how they can be transformed into something what we started to call the, the Blue Park. And the idea behind this is that uh, when making the park, we start to form a territory, a more urbanized territory. Uh, the moment you start to introduce these kind of figures as, as the park figure, uh, you start to generate something or create something that uh, that unites people, that federates actually. The end is not to 
build a park like in the 19th century with its formal approach and uh, its limited scale. No, the end is more to have like a park on a territorial scale um, that has the capacity to, uh, to unite and to bring together. And this is slowly being constructed. Uh, it's a combination of a lot of small projects, a lot of small things that are uh, integrated, working together, sometimes not working together. But from the uh, academic side, uh, we are involved here to, uh, to deal with a series of summer schools, a kind of continuous reflection on uh, how to deal with this territory, what are challenges, uh, and how can we as designers intervene in this idea of the, the blue park. And last summer, um, we did a summer school, uh, which was actually also in collaboration with the uh, Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Lille. Um, and we posed actually the question on the table on the, um, we actually started to criticize a bit this idea because we see that uh, a lot of the time we're dealing with recreation and touristical uh, aspects in this, uh, in this Espace Bleu. And we put the question on the table on the ecological dimension and the social dimension uh, of, this, of this Espace Bleu, uh, that these are actually more urgent, uh, more important, more, yeah, more urgent to start working with. And also to, to, to see how this ecological capacity of this blue space could, uh, could be improved and combining this with the social agenda as well. The third one, and this is still in a startup, it's about uh, yeah, what I call the mapping of the embodied experience. Um, this is actually taking a look at the whole way of how we uh, try to register, try to map um, this territory, uh, noticing that there are already a lot of instruments existing, but most of the time these are made uh, for an urban context. And again, one starting or one changing this urban context, suddenly this, uh, this instrument starts to become invalid as well. Uh, um, the whole idea, for instance, on the right hand side with this kind of a uh, scenography that is built into the city, if you have no pedestri pedestrians in that context, the scenography is simply not operating. So um, yeah, this uh, first test in, in, in mapping where people go, what they do, uh, how, how they get there. But this is, this is actually a research line that is like starting up on uh, mapping, indicating, seeing how people move, what they do, what, where they are in this, uh, in, in this territory. And at the point, this is, is like uh, focusing on the, the, the movement itself, the territorial scale, the destination, and then the, 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 the qualities of the spaces and the places in itself. But again, this is a, a startup. Um, I'm working here with a, with a postdoc on uh, how we can uh, yeah, turn this into an actual project. But I wanted to include this simply to have like to the overview of what I'm doing and uh, what I'm working on. The fourth thing uh, is also still very preliminary in its in its research, but this is a question on how poor and rich live together. Um, it actually started with the left hand image, an image that was produced for uh, the area of Paris, and that is depicting the rich and the poor areas in Paris. And there is this very clear division um, to be seen between rich and poor, the darker the color, the richer, the more red the color becomes, the poorer the people are. And I made a similar image for uh, the same size of territory in Flanders. Uh, on the left hand bottom border, it's the city of Kortrijk. Uh, top hand left is Bruges, and on the right hand we have a we, we, we see Ghent in a very abstract way, but what struck me in this image and what strikes my colleagues as well is that uh, this clear division between rich and poor is, is not that's simple to be made in the Flemish ter territory. It's more a mosaic of uh, incomes that is like, uh, you know, it becomes like a camouflage pattern actually of uh, rich and poor living next to each other. And what we're uh, researching here is, um, again, it's on the, on the on, you know, much more on the designerly scale than on, 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 the, on the planning scale. Uh, in the Paris context, there was a statement made that rich and poor are actually divided by infrastructure and, uh, and green elements like parks. And we started to question how green is actually operating in this uh, Flanders context, how rich and poor are like living together or separated one, one from the other. And we actually all already came to the, to the finding that open space is much more like a, a federating figure between the rich and the poor instead of like a, a dividing instrument. Uh, so the, the, the green acts as a place where people go to uh, encounter one to the other and becomes actually this in-between thing between rich and poor. And we actually noticed that the division uh, is happening on a very small scale, the, smell of the scale of the plot. Uh, and it is here that actually the, the, the split up is, is being constructed, um, observing that the, the number of thresholds we have from public to private spaces is uh, much richer, much more layered in the, the, the richer areas compared to the, the poorer areas. But again, I'm not going to, to, talk, to go in detail in this one, simply to, um, to, to point out a bit what, what I'm doing with my colleagues. 
Um, and one of the other findings we had is actually that the, the very small scale and the, the layering that is possible in this uh, in this Flemish nebula, this this dispersed territory, is actually one of the key elements to uh, to have this uh, rich and poor living together, one next to the other. The last one um, I'm dealing one with is something already started in my uh, PhD research itself. It's an ongoing genealogy on uh, on dispersion. Um, again, starting from from. But I always find a bit of striking drawing uh, by Cedric Price, uh, where he stated that you have, in a way, he is like suggesting that there is this kind of steps going from uh, an ideal situation in, in, uh, in an ancient time with a, a walled city in the, in the landscape, and that it got blurred off uh, throughout the centuries, and that we are now in this like scramble tech uh, context. But when reflecting or when thinking on this, uh, or actually investigating this, this kind of idea that there are like succeeding steps, one to three, that leads us to, uh, to, to what we have now, dispersion. Um, I started to, um, to make a whole overview of literature, academic literature. This is only a piece of it from 95, but it goes back to 1800 something. But uh, in, in literature, you see that it's already from the 1800 somewhere that we are like dealing with, studying with, um, reflecting on dispersion. Uh, and the critique that is often given on uh, on dispersion that it is a post-war uh, thing that it uh, is an individual choice and so on and so on uh, with this kind of uh, genealogy i'm i'm i'm, I'm uh, constructing uh, you can actually start opposing it um, in, especially in the the belgian context and this is research that uh, Crojean, but also uh, greta block has done and the specific specifically in the belgian context one can actually see that the whole dispersion is a, is a deliberate project it's a whole idea of creating a dispersed territory to include the countryside and the organization and this has been kept up from 1850 60 somewhere until nowadays there's a whole mechanism of subsidies uh, salary cars and so on and so on to maintain this uh, this dispersion so in a way, the whole reflection or the whole, whole idea that this is something individual constructed by individual people uh, and, and post-war is contradicted by this uh, genealogy. But what is also interesting is that, uh, or what I find interesting at least, is that uh, already in the 1930s, there are this kind of uh, discourse that this Persian is a lack of urbanity and a loss of landscape and ecological values. And it works even nowadays. There are There is still literature literature being made on the, the laws of urban uh, rural values the lack of urban qualities and so on and so on so even nowadays uh, while this line has been worked out in the 1930s 80 90 years year later we are still dealing with this kind of um, of um, uh, how to say how this kind of discourse on uh, on sprawl second thing i also learned uh, well, and one of these outcomes of this uh, of this discourse is that we are fixing it by by making it more selective the how we deal with this territory Second thing I learned is that uh, this Persian is also um, a learning context. Um, in 1800s, 1910, uh, Sibang Roundtree came, came from the UK. He studied the dispersion in, uh, in Belgium and he found it actually a, a big quality and he compared it with the UK. And uh, for him, dispersion was actually a tool to prevent poverty uh, because it enabled people to be landowners, to grow some fruits and vegetables on their plot, and still to be connected with, uh, with the urban tissue because of the fine maced uh, railroad network that was installed at the time. So this learning from, I think that's also a very big value we can, uh, we can have in, uh, in dispersion. And the last thing, uh, and I'm referring to uh, um, Frank Lloyd Wright with his Broadacre City, city uh, that dispersion can be seen as a, as a prototype as a way to construct, as an exploration, as actually a kind of future, uh, exploring a kind of future, uh, simply to, to, to make this prototype, to build the prototype. And Frank, Frank Lothroy is extremely uh, interesting because he also constructed a series of houses made for his Broadacre city and he built them. Uh, so he made houses uh, demonstrating the, the whole concept of this uh, Broadacre city. And this is like in a very fast speed <laughs> to work, I'm doing the things I'm working on in this version. I know the link with the post mining areas is sometimes not there. Um, at least this is, is a kind of thematic overview on uh, what I'm doing, where I'm working in, and uh, yeah, the kind of lines of thoughts I'm uh, exploring at this point. Okay. Thank you, Martin, for this overview. Yeah, you're really, really working on interesting topics and a lot of interesting things. And I think that uh, working together ahead, we will find out how we can uh, mobilize your research on the post mining territories. Um, now we can have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, 
Can anyone want to start? Any questions or remarks? Yeah. Well, I have a question. I have first an information. <clears throat> I don't. I don't know to, uh, Thomas Sharp. I was wondering where he comes from. Is he American or is it? Uh, oh, he's, he's yep. British. British. He's British. Okay. Yes, and he was writing for a, a magazine, um, and Landscape, um, and he in the thirties he had this. It's very hard to find, but he made one article, and he was really like uh, criticizing the the loss of the the qualities of the landscape in Britain uh, because of the the sprawl that was uh, was appearing. Okay, okay, interesting. And this is this is the earliest source that I did find on uh, this kind of discourse of loss of uh, ecological and uh, agricultural values. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, and thank you. The, your presentation was very very interesting, and and now it's uh, uh, illustrating. Uh, the discussions that we had in Venice and uh, many subjects that uh, many questions at least which we have in common. So I was wondering about the method that you use uh, because you showed a lot of maps and uh, and what kind of tools do you use when you work on site? I mean, uh, is um, uh, going to the site something very important on your methods or? No, yes, it is. Um... It's actually, it's a, it's a bit, uh, I think we're still developing a lot of methods in our profession. Um, and I'm working with a combined method that is sometimes rather anthropological uh, with the interviews, uh, with questioning, with observations uh, and so on. Uh, but at the same time for the graphical representation, I'm, I'm most of the time working with, with maps and, uh, and, and the drawing. So it's actually a, co a combined way of, um, of working. Mm -hmm. But I agree. I mean, we're um, well, at least in this kind of research. We're I'm, I'm always like half in the sociology, half in the anthropology. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in the planning field. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also there. I have to do some work on distilling the method, and I hope with this research line in the embodied experience to be to work out on this uh, on this uh, method as well uh, to become much more clear on the, on the method used. Mm -hmm. Martin, uh, beautiful presentation uh by the way uh so i enjoyed it very much uh, I, I wonder if in the literature review and it, it was in one of your latest slides um, you included sieverts cities without cities mm -hmm. it's it's just um it his it's one of the books i read many many years ago and and it struck me because it was the um a voice uh from academia protecting or taking the uh, side of the suburbs and and um, theorizing uh, that suburbs and the dispersion on, and the encroaching of urbanization on Greenland uh, that created those, that, those suburbs in the end is not so negative. Um, mm. You can learn from that. Um, and and um, it was the only the only author that I read that was again taking the size of the suburbs uh, that are demonized uh, by by all, and so I wondered if you had a thought about it, because the suburbs anyway are are very well known uh, for their lack of uh, quality architectural quality and place making and, yeah. and very um, unsustainable uh, in a way for many reasons. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I'm fully aware of this discourse because I'm actually, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm often criticized for my stand I'm taking as well. Um, a few things on this one. Um, as I mentioned, we know a lot about this uh, urban placemaking. We know a lot about uh, what is the city, how to create places that are of interest, how to build with public spaces and so on and so on. Uh, but in the, the Flemish context where I'm, I'm based, grown up, working in and so on, I, I do notice that more than half of the, the, the inhabitants are not living in the traditional urban context. They're living in what you call suburb, what we started to call city or lands. Uh, and this is a, a tissue with a, a very long tradition, a very long history. Our oldest sources, uh, um, mapping sources, go back to 1780 something, uh, the Ferraris uh, maps. And already there, you do see that the whole territory has been man made, that there is a, a lot of dispersed buildings that are, that are present in there. Um, and I sometimes think that we have like a kind of um, yeah, 
<laughs> maybe a god complex that we think that we can simply erase all this pro and that we can uh, reallocate all people into the, the the city boundaries by means of speaking uh, and it, ma it made me really question on uh, are there no qualities to be found in this in this uh, all city of land uh, context uh, what is happening there is it also negative as it is presented in literature um, and, and when when you start looking at the qualities instead of uh, uh, towards the problems you do notice that there are uh, a number of things to be found such as the the proximity of the open space is, a, is an enormous quality you have uh, in this kind of tissues uh, there's also a high quality of living especially in the in the flemish context uh, there is a possibility to uh, create an alternative mobility especially now with the e-bikes that are popping up everywhere suddenly all things are uh, are, are more possible than, than only using the car uh, and what also struck me and this was uh, based on the interviews that there is a um, an importance of the proximity, an importance of the nearby. Um, in the 150 interviews, the, when I mapped them out, uh, people were always indicating things that were happening in the nearby, and it was uh, most of the time, uh, most of the time when they had to commute, it was for their work, uh, for the rest of their activities. Uh, they were doing it in the neighborhood, by means of speaking, or in the neighboring hamlet or the neighboring uh, small village. And when I started the interviews, I had the kind of assumption that they would always go to the bigger urban uh, complex, to the bigger cities. Uh, but during the interviews, it was very clear that they were avoiding these uh, these cities because they are difficult to enter. You have issues to park your car. It costs you some money. Uh, so they are avoiding them in a way, and they only go there for very specific events, such as a, a yearly fair or a theater piece that cannot be seen in their uh, in the neighborhood. So in a way, I discovered um, that there is like an yeah an alternative realm for people living in uh, an old city, old land context, doing a lot of things there, focusing there, and avoiding in a way even the the, the traditional city. So yeah, I I, I, I think Sieverts was in in, in that regard. Uh, at the time, he was a bit controversial because he looked at the qualities instead of the the problems, and he actually made a whole plea to be more uh yeah, start to embrace in a, in a way the this quality is to be found and i do think that he's uh well, i do find that he's right in this kind of uh, reflections on on on, on sprawl uh, or the suburb and what is also interesting with this genealogy is that uh, you notice that from the 1890s on um in our discipline we looked at the sprawl we named it periphery as a kind of secondary thing we had the city and then the overflow but over the years, suddenly this, uh, well, not suddenly, over the years, this became uh, an autonomous uh, form. We, in, in the literature, you see that we are starting to reflect on the territory as something else. It's not a city that's overflowed. No, it has its own qualities, its own resources, its own history, and so on. So it become, becomes like a new urban form in a way that is inscribed in between the city and the land. And, and therefore, yeah, again, we, we call it that way. Uh, Paula Vigano is always referring to it as the horizontal metropolis. So there is a lot of name giving, but it becomes its own identity. And that I do find very interesting. So quite an extensive answer on, <laughs> on the question. <laughs> Thank you. I have also a small um, reaction about the um, tools of togetherness. Mm -hmm. I really like this concept that you developed and uh, the photos you showed us with this urban uh, furniture, some few trees in the middle of the square. And uh, uh, then we found out that it was really empty mm -hmm. during the day. This place is empty. And um, for me personally, when I arrived to Europe, <laughs> European Union, because I come from Ukraine, which is really different from uh, different space organization from Europe. I really was um, surprised also by this very empty spaces. And I didn't really find out why people don't go there. It's empty on a, a Sunday, it's empty during the day. So yeah, it's, it was uh, interesting for me to hear that. But uh, well, these are of course the historical uh, historical places you find in this in the small hamlets. Um, and historically seen, they did have a function or they did have a representation i mean they represented either the church or the the, the state or even commercial uh, powers and up till nowadays they are used at, at specific moments i mean they are used for the yearly fair or on the you know, something we call the braderie in, in, in flanders but uh, and sometimes there's a bicycle tour going on so they are used on very very specific moments but in general they are no longer the reference points for uh, the inhabitants um and the strange thing or what I find very striking is that uh, from government point of view, 
uh, we are constantly refitting them, readapting them, redoing them, um, and thinking that all meetings will happen there, that all people will go there. And it's this kind of assumption. Um, as governments, even as designers, we assume that they are public, and then the public should go there. And there, I think there is a, a misfit uh, between what is taught and how it is used in reality. Um, okay. About, can I ask a question? Yes, a very short question because we very have very short question. Talk. Okay. Uh, well, it, it was about the the blue park. Uh, mm -hmm. You said it was mostly designed for um, touristic purposes, mm -hmm. and uh, that it could be interesting to open it to uh, ecological or uh, social issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Could, could you just a little bit develop on that on that issue? Yes, yes. Uh, well, maybe <laughs> I was a bit short and, and yeah. strict, strict in the presentation, but uh, the this, this idea of the blue park as a federating figure over the, the borders um, is a very valid idea uh, because it has a capacity to unite people and to create a, a common territory. Um, there are five lines defined by the Euro Metropolis to work on. And amongst them is the touristical and recreational aspect. But we see in the reality that the, this one is the most successful one, the most easiest installed, the most uh, you know, elaborated one uh, at this point. Um, and in the image, there was a small uh, picture of uh, what is now called uh, Le Carre Bleu. It's actually a cycling tour of 90 kilometers along the rivers and canals. It's actually a loop of 90 kilometers. Um, and it's because of this one, uh, this Carre Bleu, that I, I started to reflect on it. And I, I started to question that um, what is very striking is that cycling around the Carre Bleu, you, you see a lot of these uh, uh, recreational people cycling with bikes of 5,000 euros. And they cycle through uh, Roubaix, which is one of the most deprived areas in the north of France. And it's this kind of contradiction that is a, was an eye-opener for me that um, we have extremely wealthy people using this blue space. And at the same time, it's running through very deprived areas. Uh, and it made me wonder on how um, this blue space could become a part of everybody's daily life. Uh, how can we inscribe the, the blue space in the, in the daily life of, of, uh, of people that have uh, uh, small incomes, for instance? Um, the reflection started this summer. We did a, a summer school with, with 25 students uh, on it, uh, but we are not finished with it. Um, it ended up in traditional architectural design, so we are still we are puzzled with how to deal with it, how to use the capacity of this blue space for everyone and not only for a select group of people. And then moreover, if you start to combine this blue space with the uh, ecological and, and climate adaptation uh, agenda, the puzzle becomes even more complex. Um, so I think we are at the beginning of a, a rather large uh, research project there to uh, see how this water body, this water element can uh, can be of benefit for different agendas. But it's good that there is a, a partnership, a strong partnership that is supporting this, uh, this reflection as well. Okay, thank you. Very good, thank you, Martin. I think uh, I know that you have to leave at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. yeah and then you will come back half past 11 it's correct okay. yes I'm sorry for this but I had another meeting That's before okay. this one so yeah That's okay no worries okay so we will continue with the presentation from Celia Caputo on urban agriculture urban regeneration and productivity and plus some in, uh, insight on the post mining cities in UK Silvio, please maybe present yourself a little bit also for uh, people that don't know you. So I share my screen now. Is it shared? Can you see? Yes. Um, okay, so, um, well, this is a very, very different um, topic from the one that Martin presented, uh, and it's about urban agriculture, and it's, and it's um, my research interest for the last 10 years. Um, I, I, I don't know how to, uh, I don't know where that research interest come from. I'm interested, I'm my, uh, interested in food and sustainability, and so um, and I'm an architect, uh, and I'm interested in the city. At, at my, my my work mainly is at a city scale. So the connection between food 
and uh, the city and how uh, food shapes cities um was there it was always there probably uh, but but i'm also interested in the political aspects of um uh, food and when and and food and urbanism and when studying the, the history of urban agriculture is is quite clear uh, that um uh, the, the 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 uh, movement of uh, the, the sorry I'm, I'm i'm starting again it's quite clear that there has been social movements that fought for um the um uh, ownership of spaces to grow food in cities and that happened already uh, at least in the uk in the 18th century uh, with fights uh, between uh, people from villages uh, and the uh, uh, lords in or, or that owned uh, the the entire region or the entire um, area uh, 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 and that reclaimed commons common land that was used by the peasants and by the villagers uh, to grow food uh, and that was understood as a common good and so there's been always this contended um, space, uh, contested space uh, in, in history and the history of urbanization uh, between those that uh, have and those that have not. Uh, how to share the common good, how to share the space uh, that we live in, uh, and growing food in these spaces was one of the possibilities. So all this um, in, uh, this, this, this um, interest in, in the political aspects of uh, how we uh, uh, perceive and use the space, the right to the city, um, and the contradiction between urban and rural uh, that is implicit in, in the way we construct cities and understand cities, um, draw my interest in, into this subject. I tried to find some connections between um, post-mining cities and urban uh, agriculture, and maybe uh, that is in urban regeneration. And I'll try to explain what I mean in the next slides. So first of all, a definition of urban agriculture, and it's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, what you see here is actually one of the best examples of urban agriculture, the best, best case studies is uh, Cuba. Uh, Cuba was um, subject to an embargo in the 1990s um, uh, that followed immediately after the um, uh, the, uh, the, the um, end of the USSR. Uh, of the Russia, Russian Empire, uh, that was his um, uh, protector number one, and and was and Cuba was uh, receiving all sort of supplies from Russia. Uh, that communication, that uh, supply chain uh, stopped, and uh, out of the blue, uh, um, the U.S. Uh, imposed an embargo, and and uh, nothing could be delivered to Cuba, and Cuba had to out of the blue. Um, it becomes self-sufficient uh, when it was not before, and they managed through urban agriculture. And so um, uh, the, the urban agriculture since then has been defined as the what is written uh, in the caption uh, as the practice of cultivating, uh, processing, and distributing food in urban but also peri-urban areas. Um, there are plenty of studies ur uh, on urban agriculture that have been developed over the last two decades. Uh, clearly, urban agriculture is, is about producing food in cities, uh, but uh, the productivity of uh, uh, and the, the capability to produce food and the quantity of that food produced is not the first objective of that practice. There are many social benefits associated to it, um, and they've been uh, identified through studies interviews, observations, um, and they've been measured sometimes. Um, I have list here a few of them uh, from a study from Sustain, which is an organization and a, a NGO that works on uh, sustainable food, uh, uh, including urban agriculture, that is considered a, a way to produce food that is very much sustainable, and that ticks the three boxes of uh, sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. 
Uh, I've listed a few, the right to the city. What that means is that um, there is the possibility or the, 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 or some many of the movements of the urban agricultural movements have been uh, promoted and, um, um, and um, communicated as attempts to use the space that otherwise wouldn't have been used uh, for um, uh, uh, for the majority of us. So private space, unoccupied space, own space left derelict that is uh, squatted um, and appropriated by social movements um, uh, and to grow food. And so food um, uh, uh, is, is, uh, it, it is the um, uh, focus or the um, uh, lever that allows these movements uh, to get together um, and and um, uh, to make big statements about the, the right to um, to use the public space. It's also used to attract people, the interest of people, uh, people that live marginal lives and that um, look at um, uh, the urban gardens and the community gardens as a possibility to get together, to talk, to exchange, to socialize in cities that sometimes do not offer that possibility. Um, economic development, uh, which is probably um, the smallest of the benefits that urban agriculture can um, uh, uh, attain. Education, ecological education, um, uh, improvement of the environments, leisure, sustainable neighborhoods, you name it. But there's one and the, is at the bottom of the list that is urban regeneration that I would like um uh, uh, to elaborate on and it's probably the one that can connects better with the focus of this network uh, the post mining cities and the way and the models of regeneration of um, urban agriculture that can apply also to uh, post mining cities um, i have been selecting uh, the models of urban regeneration uh, um, from urban agriculture and urban agriculture case studies that are particularly suitable for post mining cities. So I'm presenting three or four of um, uh, case studies that may be relevant um, when conceptualized and when understood as, uh, as uh, possibilities, models that can be used in any kind of urban regeneration um, project. So here are some case studies and I call them models. Uh, I call them models and I name them. Uh, model one is the movement. Um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this movement. It's called Incredible Edible Todd Morden. And it started in the city, in the not very big city, in the town of Todd Morden, uh, a town that has not particular uh, historical qualities or any particular um, uh, quality that uh, makes, makes it outstanding. Um, and like many of the cities in, in England, um, uh, is, is not particularly rich uh, and uh, there's a high level of unemployment um, and uh, it was one with the highest uh, deprivation um, index. There's a deprivation index uh, used in the UK that measures um, the uh, not only poverty but access to services like educational services, health services, and opportunities for people um, uh, to live uh, better lives. Um, and thought more than was not ranked. Um, at, at, at the lowest end of the deprivation index, therefore very good uh, way of life. Um, but what happened is that a, 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 a group of people uh, uh, started growing food in marginal areas of the cities, um, islands that were next to um, very busy uh, roads, uh, uh, busy with uh, traffic, uh, car traffic, um, or uh, areas, uh, very small areas in between gates and buildings in schools. Um, and and started uh, and, and 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 that action um, was uh, was a catalyst for higher interest for the people. And when this group formalized um, the program 
of that group uh, and called it incredible edible thought, thought more than uh, when they formalized it they stated that one of the aims was to transform the city by occupying spaces that were neglected they were left empty uh, and and the way they wanted to do that is by growing food edible crops in those spaces because they thought that crop that uh, food was a catalyst for social betterment um, they didn't stop there uh, with their food they uh, distributed uh, that food to um, the uh, low-income families but they organized also um, uh, uh, they organized uh, markets, uh, sales of that food, events, uh, uh, festivals, uh, and they and by doing so they attracted more and more people. And the entire city of Tot Modern uh, became identified as the city of the incredible edible Tot Modern. And people in Tot Modern are very proud now of that label. Um, and as a consequence, um, there are 120 edible cities now that declared um, their status as incredible edible and the city and the name of the city and, um, and 700 worldwide. These are pictures from uh, marginal spaces occupied by um, uh, uh, for food growing or uh, uh, markets and uh, the way they sell their food in markets, in market stalls. Uh, the second model I called the, I called it the place based hub, a hub, uh, not a movement. Uh, but just one place and the activities, the program in, that in this place is capable of regenerating the entire place. And this is the case of Edible Eastside in Birmingham. Eastside is in, in a, a big, big um, uh, industrial, former industrial area in Birmingham that for decades has been neglected, um, abandoned uh, old uh, factories, uh, abandoned uh, residential buildings, um, not a safe place, uh, not a nice place to live in. Um, a group of people, uh, architects actually, uh, that had their um, office just next to this um, scrapyard. Uh, it, it's, it's just a, a yard of an old um, uh, uh, factory that was left completely empty. Uh, they started this uh, community garden, uh, they built some raised beds and they started growing food and then with, with a container, they, they, they transported the container uh, there in that place, they organized a cafe where they were serving some of the food grown in the uh, community garden and they organized, they started organizing events and so these attracted people there um, and, and, and people were flowing in into a, a place that was considered quite dangerous and safe um, and, and uh, transformed bit by bit uh, the, uh, the, the, the crowd of people that were circulating in this space and therefore um, uh, triggered an, an, a, a small micro regeneration of that place. Uh, the model number three is the social enterprise. Uh, there are plenty of social enterprises that, uh, at least in the UK, UK, but are also in France. I don't know about Belgium. I guess in Belgium too. Actually, I visited one in Ghent. Um, social enterprises that work on food, on, on uh, in urban agriculture. This is. Uh, a social enterprise called Growing Communities has been uh, there for um, 20, 20 years now. What they did is, is, uh, is uh, they created what they call a patchwork farm. They occupied uh, small spaces um, uh, that were left empty, uh, one in, in a park, um, another one in, in uh, the backyard of, of, of a school. Um, they agreed with the owners uh, that they could grow food there and they started organizing this um, patchwork farm, these dispersed this farms uh, across the, um, uh, the uh, 
area of Hackney in London. Uh, they started selling this food and, you, and they started selling this food at the local people there uh, and they um, and they became more and more um, uh, famous and they started occupying, uh, expanding the uh, patchwork farm and therefore uh, transforming the place, regenerating the place bit by bit when it was possible, um, when land was offered to them. Uh, on a temporary basis, never with permanent lease, but but by becoming established, then it was more and more difficult for the landowners to uh, get back the land uh, because they were becoming an institution there, uh, very well known in Hackney in this area of London. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, they they grew, uh, they uh, they kept the promise um, in in their name, growing communities, and they're still still growing now. Uh, they're a social and they formed as a social enterprise, and they have a, a transparent um, revenue. Uh, statement every year uh, and in the latest report this year report they declared an income from the sales that it was close to two million pounds um, so they made they made two million pounds by selling their tomatoes and and um, onions spring onions and whatever they grow in their patchwork farm uh, and a net profit of um, uh, 80,000 pounds. So they, they are demonstrating probably one of the few in, in London and in the UK uh, that, that um, it, it is possible uh, to create jobs and to um, uh, generate an income uh, with urban agriculture. It's not easy, but they managed. Uh, the fourth model is the, the web, and this is an interesting case study, I think, um, is an interesting case study uh, because it was um, be because it's, it's, it's based on a platform, it was enabled by a platform, a digital platform of capital growth, which is an initiative um, um, funded by um, several funding streams, the big lottery, which is a big funding stream here in the UK, um, uh, but also the mayor of London. Um, what they uh, he, he started in, I think, 2008, uh, and what they, um, uh, the, their objective was to um, start um, 2012 new growing spaces by 2012, which was the year of London Olympics. It sounded like an impossible um, target, uh, but what they did is to, uh, with the money that they had from the funds, is to create a micro fund. They were, they, they were awarding something like 500 pounds to the projects of uh, community groups or groups that were submitting a proposal on their platform and, and, and they were funding um, uh, groups that were starting new growing spaces where there was no growing space before, food growing space uh, in any place. It could, and, and in any way, uh, in, with any um, a technique for growing food, it could be in buckets, it could be in barrels, it could be in raised beds, um, it could be in skips. Um, uh, as long as it was the space occupied at least five square meters and unoccupied before, uh, uh, that was okay. They were eligible for funding. Um, as, as, as it happened, uh, they, uh, um, uh, they did so well that they went uh, beyond their objective. Uh, if you go on their website, they, there's a map of uh, all the growing spaces in London uh, and, and the, they awarded uh, uh, the micro funding to more than, I think, 2,300 growing spaces. Most of these spaces now have gone. Uh, but um, uh, they, they didn't live a long life, uh, but many of them still um, are occupied and, uh, and actually they've been a catalyst again for what I call a micro regeneration of the areas where uh, they started. Um, 
quickly, um, I've, I, I've, I've shown what, um, uh, how urban agriculture can be a catalyst for urban regeneration with these several models. They're not only these the models, there are may, uh, very many, and there are many of stories to be um, documented and to be told. Um, but what I wanted now to um, uh, demonstrate is that um, uh, urban agriculture can be also productive. So it's not only about social benefits and sometimes economic benefits, but it's also environmental and practical benefits. Um, this is uh, the next slides. They just document uh, some of the aspects of a project that is uh, almost coming to an end uh, and is being funded by Horizon 2020 uh, with a particular um, uh, funding stream that is called um, SUGI, Sustainable uh, Urbanization uh, Global Initiative, um, a project that I uh, participated in five countries uh, and the idea of this project is to understand um, uh, the uh, trying to explore how resource efficient and productive is urban agriculture we all know that um, through studies that they can generate many social benefits. But if we compare it to, to conventional agriculture, is it better in terms of use of resources? Is it more sustainable? Um, and so this, this was the focus of the project that was called the few meter, food, energy, water meter. Five countries and 74, I think, case studies. Uh, from different types of urban agriculture. One of the objectives of the um, project was to understand how the organization of the practice uh, impacts the resource efficiency. Uh, so there are many ways of organizing urban agriculture. The, the most famous one is allotments, where um, an individual or a household leases a piece of land uh, in in uh, the cent in uh, city center or in the um, uh, outskirt um, and cultivates it for its own benefits and leisure. But there are community gardens and they they uh, are run by small uh, community groups and and they share the food between them or they sell it sometimes. And there are city farms, farms that are uh, cultivating for uh, growing food co commercially for profit. So we wanted to understand uh, what is the difference, what difference it makes, uh, the type of organization um, of growing food. Uh, what we found is here, we, uh, we measured uh, the productivity kilograms per square meter of the 70 plus case studies over two years, 2019 and 2020. France, you may be glad to know, is the winner uh, by far. Um, but we analyzed why and, and the case studies were um, influencing, of course, the, the uh, level of productivity. So if you look at Germany and Poland, uh, they, the case studies are mainly allotments. If you like, look at uh, the UK, the case studies and the US, the case studies are mainly uh, uh, community gardens or social farms that are comparable to community gardens, um, to the community gardens in Great Britain. And France, where uh, the, the highest productivity was mainly um, uh, attributed to um, uh, commercial farms. Uh, the water use we uh, also met um, and measured, uh, and France was by far the most um, uh, water intensive of all the countries. And again, uh, I cannot go into detail, there's not enough time, but it is linked not only um, to um, uh, practical reasons, but also to the way the um, uh, urban agriculture plot is managed collectively, um, commercially, uh, or individually. We also try to understand uh, the rate of recycling of the water. So who was using um, rainwater, uh, harvesting rainwater and reusing it? And France was the best one in uh, collecting rainwater and using it. 
uh, we measured the trips to the gardens to understand um, uh, how um, intensive, uh, energy intensive, uh, the um, uh, growing food in cities was, especially in big cities like New York, which was the city uh, where all the case studies in US were, or London, where all the um, case studies in the UK were. Um, and I think I stop here without giving uh, other details because probably I am beyond, did I go beyond time or do I have more time? Well, you go a little bit beyond the time, yeah. Then okay, so quickly, post-mining cities okay. and then beyond. Shall I do that or shall I? Uh, yes, 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 do it, please. It's interesting. Okay, so um, this only scratches the surface. I promised to look into it, and I did, um, uh, with a, 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 an history of um, uh, industrial revolution like the UK has. Inevitably, um, uh, coal mining uh, was very important. It's been it's been um, a, a very uh, um, powerful engine for development and also for outsourcing um, fuel, fossil fuel, uh, in, in, during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and still now, although now they're decommissioning the last um, mines, uh, so there are 16 locations where field mines uh, are concentrated. Uh, different types of field mines, they can be uh, wells, they can be um, open uh, field mines or my, uh, coal fields or uh, mines, more traditional mines. Um, they, Kent is included, uh, there are a few in Kent, um, but the, the locations are many, sometimes very close to the city, sometimes completely in, the, in, the, in open fields in the countryside. Uh, the um, uh, Thatcher uh, years um, contributed to decommission um, to the, the end of the coal industry in the UK and coincided with a, a, with, with a, a drop of income in many of the cities that were um, relying on the coal mining industry and, and that uh, uh, resulted in, in decline, blight, poverty in all the villages next that were living out of the coal mining industry. Um, so, so a fact sheet, coal fields account for the 8% of the population in England. Um, 10% in Scotland and 25% in Wales. Um, Yorkshire, Yorkshire is probably uh, the one that has a more intensive um, uh, coal field um, mining past uh, and, and therefore um, uh, more case studies there to look for rather than Kent, which is a very small um, where coal mines are, are very small, very few. Um, uh, the land, 21% uh, of uh, the coal field, um, the coal field local authorities contain 21% uh, of the national stock of contaminated and direct leaked land. And that means that much of the land um, owned by the local uh, authorities that was a, a former coal mines is still very much polluted. Um, lots of deprivation, as you can see. Um, uh, but the uh, uh, probably the most interesting uh, point that I would like to make is that uh, the, there is an agency, the Home So Community a Communities Agency. There is a government agency, um, together with other groups uh, that uh, are continuously helping. It's very um, active uh, their commitment to regenerate and redevelop. Um, uh, the post mining cities, but what they do actually is they concentrating in uh, financing um, affordable homes, and so that is what they do rather than trying to regenerate the economy. Um, but once homes are there, um, th these villages are still very very poor, and and the 
deprivation that they um, suffer from is there even if properties um, are available um, uh, at, at a cheap price or cheap rent. Um, there are many, many um, studies. Uh, uh, some of them, many of them have been uh, produced by the, the Coalfield Regeneration Trust, which is an engine for reports on um, uh, the post mining communities. Um, so there are many initiatives that have been um, funded or started uh, to regenerate these places. And I think, uh, and th this is the map of the uh, coal fields in uh, uh, in Kent, uh, with some of the pictures of the main coal field: Tilmanstone, Snowdon Down, uh, Bettershangen, and that is it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia, for showing us this very wide range of urban agricultural initiatives in UK and for this insight on the UK uh, post mining situation. Uh, did you have a chance to visit one of these incredible edible sites? Are there any in the Kent County? Sorry, are there? I didn't hear that. Yeah, did you have a chance to visit one of these incredible edible uh, initiative sites? Yeah, well, yes, they, I mean, you don't, what you, you, I, I think that they are, um, uh, what you see is that there are places where food is grown, uh, but what you don't see is how the food, and it's difficult to see, is how the food is then used, um, perceived by people uh, as an engine to increase socialization uh, and you can see that only when one of the events uh, of uh, they have open, uh, garden days they have uh, food sales um, and so if you put, if you uh, uh, participate to one of these events they are very telling so you don't see any you, you don't perceive much changes um visual changes in the built environment but when you attend one of these events you see how lively the city is and how it is transformed because they're packed with people crowded um very joyful um and 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 that place making uh, the, the, those activities that create the place place making are there you can tell so yes they're very um, successful, I would say, from this point of view. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, in France, in the um, north of France, in the, the mining basin, we have the incredible, the incredible comestibles. Uh, uh, I didn't know it was uh, uh, coming from, uh, from England, you know, from Great Britain. But, you know, France uh, is the only country in, um, in, the, in the EU that has now an urban farming association. So oh. there is an association that represents the urban farmers, like a farming association, um like associations in a, a conventional agriculture now now they're represented by a body and that body is recognized as such and so urban farming is becoming a professional um is recognized as as, as mm -hmm. a profession because there's a, again a, a professional body behind them mm -hmm. and it's the first country in in europe mm -hmm. yeah and that's something very important uh, in mining territories because, at least in north of France, um, miners were obliged to have their own gardens um, for uh, growing their, their own food. And they really had to take care of it. So there is a, um, a great culture of, uh, uh, about uh, growing, growing food. So that's something very important for uh, urban regeneration, mining regeneration. And I was wondering um, the relationship that this movement has with uh, the Rob Hopkins one? They, they, they have, 
Yeah, they have. Uh, they they have. I I I don't think um, they have many 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 connections. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that surely the transition town movement was an inspiration. They came first, um, but uh, incredible, able thought more than um, is is looking at food specifically, uh, whereas the yeah. transition town movement is 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 a, it covers all the aspects of, uh, of urban yeah. life. Uh, one thing that is very um, important to consider is that all these movements, behind these movements, there are two or three leaders. So any movement, uh, and this must be uh, a, an unwritten social law, any movement uh, requires uh, somebody that that pulls things and pushes Absolutely. things and so there, there are behind each one of these movements and case studies there's a face there's a man or a woman that are um, working full time um, to make things happen yeah of course yeah and you know in um, in september when we had a uh, our meeting in Venice about, uh, uh, but you were there by Zoom. Uh, I was there, but only yeah. in the morning. And did you did you hear the presentation of uh, Elena Cogaturanza from uh, Lausanne? She she presented. She made um, a parallel between uh, the history of uh, agriculture and the history of mining. And that I was very remember. interesting because she she really. Um, showed that uh, um, the history of mining is very similar to the history of uh, industrial agriculture, I mean, the, the becoming industrial industry with agriculture. And um, it was very, very, very bright, very interesting. Hmm. Elena, what's her name? Cogato Lanza. She's Italian too. <laughs> I, 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 there's, uh, there's a, you share the link to the podcast of the. Yeah, yeah. Margarita will, will do yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I will share okay. the link in our YouTube channel when you can discover all the videos. Okay, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll look at the presentation again. Yeah, and I write the, the name down for you. Okay, I think we can have one short question from someone, if any. Uh, maybe it's, it's maybe not so short, but I, 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 I found this presentation super interesting and I wanted just to add uh, a comment uh, and, and to know what you think about that. Um, because I, I followed recently uh, a classes about uh, life cycle analysis and we had uh, a big debate about the relation between social and environment that you very well uh, demonstrated in your presentation. And so in, in that classes, we had to learn to use a software to calculate the impact on the environment classified uh, by uh, impact on oceans, on uh, pollution, etc. And uh, I tried to compare a plastic glass made in China and a paper glass from a coffee machine uh, by re, uh, made by a recycling paper and made in France, etc. And the, the result was pretty surprising because it showed that um, the impact on the environment from the plastic glass uh, made in China could be way smaller than the one with the paper glass. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I asked to the teacher <laughs> Yeah, well, we have the same problem. I mean, we have in our in our in the in the project that we that I showed you, we have experts in LCA in life cycle analysis, and they are completing a study on the um, um, on the case studies uh, that uh, that um, that we have uh, where we measured productivity, water, energy, and so on, trips to the garden. And we have the same problem. We have um, the the picture that comes out is is not so good. Uh, so if if we compare conventional agriculture, which is very very polluting, 
uh, and very harmful uh, with, uh, with the uh, carbon footprint of a community garden. Well, the community garden is much more uh, carbon intensive. Um, and this is for a series of reasons. Uh, one is the economy of scale. So if you think that a community garden is 500 square meters, maybe 1,000 square meters. But in that 1,000 square meters, they have raised beds with timber. They have a, a shed where they uh, host activities. Um, they have uh, lots of material because what they do is to engage with people, uh, not only to grow food. And so they are multifunctional. And with that multifunctionality, lots of things come in that are carbon intensive um, and it's and and it's very difficult to then make the case for something when you consider only the um, scientific evidence uh, that can be measured what cannot be measured and cannot be quantified is perhaps equally important, the social benefits, but you can't um, look at the, cannot quantify with the same metrics, the social benefits and uh, materials or um, resources used. So it's difficult, it's difficult, but it's very useful also because it points out that things that needs to be improved if you believe that, um, say urban agriculture um, is the way forward uh, or needs to be um, scaled up uh, and contribute to food production. You know how to, uh, the areas for improvement of that practice through life cycle analysis, understanding what is that uh, generates more uh, pollution, more carbon. Yes, and, and uh, I, I think uh, there is also some uh, life cycle analysis about social. So maybe yeah, that, one we'll have to cross. Yeah, we, tr we, we tried, we tried very, I tried personally very hard to convince the life cycle analysis experts to include um, social aspects. They wouldn't take it. They, 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 they just believe that, um, the attempts to include uh, social practices within the life cycle analysis is not ro sufficiently robust. It's not reliable. Is is um, you have you have to um, there are uh, too many unreliable factors there, and they are quite um, what's the word? Uh, decisions are. Uh, um, you need to allocate to what you do behavioral factors a carbon impact and that is um, uh, arbitrary and and random and it cannot be shared is based on your opinion or an interpretation of uh, what cannot be measured mm -hmm. so it cannot be shared yes yes but that's terrible that they they yeah they do not take into account more yeah, social <laughs> well interesting right okay thank you silvio uh, we have to move on this next presentation uh from uh, valentina manente which is phd student in university of kent uh with a intervention on learning from the pilots of circular bioeconomy in a social housing estate. Uh, Valentina, please, when you're ready, you can share your screen. We would like to hear your presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, Margarita, for uh, uh, having me. I am Valentina Manente, and I am a Silvio uh, PhD student. Together, we are um, we are having uh, a research on the urban agricultural nexus in the, um, sorry, I'm sharing my screen, uh, in the um, barrios of Bogota. There you go, sorry. 
I'm just trying to. I think that Silvio has to stop sharing his screen before. Oh. Okay. Because we, st we still can see your screen, Silvio. You'll be in the bottom, in the middle of the screen. Um, Silvio, you're muted. Um, what do I have to do? I, I see a new share in, in the menu bar. And so there is a green bar that says you are screen sharing, and then you have to click stop share, to, and it's a red oh, button. Oh, sorry. All right. So I'll reshare. You can see it. Okay. So you can see it now. Yes. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. Um, so I don't know how to, um, okay, yes. So my name is Valentina Manente. I am a PhD student uh, and I'm collaborating with uh, Silvio on uh, research of urban agriculture uh, in uh, the barrios of Bogota in Colombia. So I was given the opportunity of take um, part to a study on circular, circular bioeconomies in uh, social housing estates in London. So this is um, a project that um, is gonna last four months and um, we are currently on month two of the collaboration. And we are trying together with um, Micro um, Leap, Mad Leap, that is um, a company that does um, anaerobic micro anaerobic digesters to develop a blueprint so a methodology um, on circular, the use of food waste in social housing estates in London. So before um, taking you to the work, I will briefly introduce my, um, sorry, my, um, my uh, research. So my research is, as I said, on urban agriculture in the global south. So uh, Bogota in Colombia is um, in Latin America. And so what is the main difference um, from literature uh, between uh, urban agriculture as it's perceived in the global north and urban agriculture in the global south? Um, so in the global north, uh, there is a tendency to see it as um, an activity that is actually done for leisure, at least in the recent times. And it's done by well-off citizens in general. So people that are doing it as a hobby um, and it's purely recreational, whereas in the global south is done for self-sustenance by uh, people that can actually afford to, um, to buy their food in uh, very impoverished areas. But now, as you can see from this graphic, actually um, in the global north, this tendency has been uh, changing over the years. So for instance, we, we know that the, there were uh, very important uh, movements at the beginning of the 20th century that would see uh, urban agriculture as something that could sustain um, entire neighborhoods. And also during the war, we had uh, victory gardens. So actually people were called and they did um, uh, you know, um, grow food in cities to actually sustain themselves and their troops during wars. And so we can see how um, in the global south, there is no really literature before um, the 70s. And it's been uh, described as an activity that is mainly um, connected to self-sustainment. But then these two trends are actually aligning right now. And one reason could be because there is um, societal change in the global south, but also the big uh, economic crisis of 2008 has changed things even in the global north. And also this could be ascribed to a general misrepresentation of urban agriculture in the, uh, of, in the global south because it was um, mainly described by academics in the global north. So let's say that we have this sort of ripple effect that um, implied that once they saw something and they uh, labeled it, it was then passed on to other academics in the global north that by word of mouth in a way would just uh, amplify the conception, the idea that this was what was happening in the global south. But um, actually, as we said, it's not like that. So 
Um, what is the role of urban agriculture in the sustainable development of global cities and in the case of Bogota? As Silvio was pointing out, urban agriculture is not just um, a matter of food production and uh, consumption of water and electricity and so on and so forth, but it does also contribute to some um, social elements um, that are, for instance, the personal well-being, um, the networking and uh, the cohesion of communities. Of course, there is an economic impact and there is food um, created, but also people learn new skills and they get educated about uh, nature and environmental preservation. Um, so my task in Bogota, and I'm about to leave uh, for uh, field work in a month, is to actually uh, apply the food, um, the few meter methodology onto uh, several um, gardens in Bogota and uh, where I, I hope I will be able to measure both quantities but also um, social impacts of, of this activity. And so you can see here, I pinned down all the case studies that I currently have in Bogota. So this is the city. And this for reference are the social strata. So um, just in a nutshell, it's um, an indicator that tells you how well off that neighborhood is, is done measuring the state of the built environment. So um, we go from uh, corrugated iron as roofing uh, in the strata, the stratus number one, to classic uh, historic villas to in the stratus uh, number six. So um, as you can see, there are many, many uh, gardens. The ones that accepted to collaborate with us are uh, a handful and actually some others are on their way to collaborate. Um, and they are mostly in the uh, less fortunate areas of the city. But we can see that there are also some that are actually in the areas that are uh, better off. So um, definitely this is going to be an interesting experience. I wanted also to show you what one of the, our participants um, does. So this is Welta Chizaya. And uh, as you can see, uh, when we think about urban agriculture in the global south, there is a little bit of misconception, um, as we said, that is given by different factors. But when we look closely to what actually is done, is being done, we can see how we go from, uh, of course, urban agriculture, but then there is also teaching, there is also local farmers and organic markets, there are also cultural identity, there is also community cohesion again, but, um, and this connects to the next, uh, why this was important for me and this contributed to my learning uh, for for my field work. So this, this experience about the circular economy added to, uh, my, um, to my experience in my PhD. You can see how there is a lot of uh, parts that connect with environment and that are trying to uh, close, let's say, the circle in consumption. So we can see that there is composting, there is food um, seed banks, so, and there is also, for instance, dry toilets. So that is to say that actually, um, in, in many cases, uh, we can see how in urban agriculture, we're not talking only about one aspect, but we're talking about a full system that in a way functions on its own. And there is a logic behind that. So without further ado, um, I'm introducing, I introduced my PhD. Um, now I'm going to address uh, this experience, the design um, exchange partnership, that is this design experience that, um, brought us to develop uh, or study a blueprint for the case of Teviot Estate in London. Um, so this uh, was, uh, is supposed, is centered to the, onto the concept of circular economy. So you can see how the idea was to actually, it's centered around the concept of um, anaerobic digestion and how this can generate compost that then can be used uh, on urban agriculture and then can com be consumed by citizens uh, in the the in the area, or can be sold and then can be again recycled. Um, so the context, as I was saying, is a social housing estate, 
um, in the east area of London, you can see here. And uh, you can see how the structure, um, the, the plan of this area is uh, similar to many other projects that were developed during the 60s and 70s uh, in London. So it's done to accommodate, um, let's say, um, working, uh, the working class in general. And so these um, areas are currently going under um, renovation in many cases. And so that's why um, it was proposed that we try to implement um, a new model of consumption for this uh, specific case study. So um, this is a little bit uh, of the inside of the site. So you can see that um, there are there is plenty of um, court areas and then row houses as well. Plenty of green, but right now it's just used as a common area that is just sitting there and not really utilized. And also right now waste collection is mainly done um, in a centralized way. So we're talking about um, big bins that just get collected um, regularly from the city, uh, well, from the ward. Um, but the thing is also that there is no um, food waste collection in place. So what uh, did we do first? Of course, we engage with the community. So we asked them, what do you think about um, food waste what do you think it can be used for? Um, do you think you would like to see a uh, recycling uh, food um, waste optimization plan in your neighborhood? Um, what do you think about the use that can be done for it? So um, what's your position towards urban agriculture? And this was done in uh, the urban site. So it's a small site that is sits just at the side of uh, the estate and is uh, mainly, um, it's an area that engages, is already engaging citizens that are interested in urban agriculture. Um, so it was interesting to hear from them as well because they, they know a bit about um, what, the, what the whole matter is. And uh, surprisingly, not surprisingly actually, they said that they didn't really mind having uh, you know, a little bit of um, movement around them, a little bit of digging and moving around soil, etc. Um, the main issue that they pointed out at was actually the coordination and the fact that they wanted an infrastructure uh, that could support their initiative. So it was more of a systemic um, issue for them. It wasn't really about um, the food waste disposal or the uh, aesthetics of the whole activity or the fact that you could then you could have them to actually grow on the same site where you were consuming your food so this was an interesting experience um, that led to actually uh, consideration on designing a model so um, what i'm showing here is actually the preliminary preliminary um, computations that led to understanding how uh, to fit a uh, food waste system um, disposal and uh, transformation and, and consumption into the area of Tavio. Um, so we did some uh, scenarios with productivity. We estimated how many families could be accommodated um, by the typology of uh, anaerobic digester that was chosen for the trial. And this led also to productivity scenarios. So how much um, can be earned by selling either the compost that gets produced uh, by anaerobic digestion, or how much can I make out of uh, selling the vegetables that I'm growing through urban agriculture? And these are monthly estimates. And of course, we're still working on the figures, but they're quite um, interesting uh, in in the terms of we actually found out that compost is uh, very um, very convenient to be produced for instance um, and then of course um, these estimations also in terms of uh, specializing the amount of uh, fertilizer that gets produced by month 
per month uh, by this uh, anaerobic digester. Um, the uh, I we design we let's say we plotted how much the production rates would have meant in terms of spatial occup occupation on the uh, on the site of Teviot. So here you can see um, with squares of five by five meters the whole site area of Teviot. Um, and here you can see the amounts that can be fertilized uh, with a production that goes from the 10th to the 100% uh, of the ID, um, so an aerobic digester uh, processor. So which means if I'm getting 10%, uh, if the machine is working at 10% of this, its capacity, we will be able to obtain this amount of um, space that gets fertilizer through the uh, product that gets out of the machine. And so you can see how on a monthly basis, this is quite impressive. Um, so the, this is the part that um, let's say uh, presents how these computations and all this, um, these uh, ideas, but also this uh, reasoning came together in uh, design in, in um, let's say architectural way. Uh, so in the, it got applied in the built environment. So um, this is the full system. We're still debating on uh, its full functioning, but essentially um, the idea was to utilize this very simple uh, taxonomy of objects and combine them in the space um, and to obtain different solutions that would um, support the type of circular economy that we design for Teviot Estate and that uh, we thought was more successful for this area. So I will briefly go through the uh, whole system. Um, I also have bigger images, but I prefer to show it here because I think it's more contextualized. Um, so from the point of view of collection, you can see how uh, there were two possibilities in place. So uh, through some literature review that has been done for the uh, booklet that is going to be um, the final outcome of this exercise, this research, um, we saw how, uh, for instance, from the zero net energy uh, network that uh, zero waste, sorry, zero waste Europe program, in several case studies, there were two main possibilities of collections, which were or at the curb side or in Eco Islands. Um, and then this would be then connected to a storage area that would be uh, in interconnected with the smaller versions of the digestion, the anaerobic digestion sites. So you can see how we decided to opt for the use of um, shipping containers because they're very cheap and uh, they can, they're modular, they can be combined in different versions that can adapt to different uh, special requirements. So they were, this was also to cater for the different scenarios, the what ifs in case um, there wasn't enough space or the, the inhabitants didn't want to have a massive um, recycling plant that would just sit there somewhere in their neighborhood. Um, so these were the three um, potential uh, visualizations of, of the three sizes of the uh, processing plants where if the anaerobic digestion happens. Um, then storage of the produce that can be done, story, storage of the outputs that can be done either on site in the bigger versions of the anaerobic digester or um, it has to be here for the smaller versions of the site. And then what happens? Um, the uh, fertilizer gets sent to the different areas of the, uh, of the social housing estates where we cultivate, uh, we grow food or even uh, ornamental plants thanks to the fertilizer that we have generated through uh, anaerobic digestion. So we can see how there is the case of intensive urban agriculture, but there is also uh, in open areas, of course, the case of simply curbsides. So um, something that 
um, implements the well-being of citizens without necessarily having them to actually grow food. It's something for the mental well-being, the appreciation of the aesthetics of nature, for instance. And a mixed solution that can be both a linear park, for instance, um, so a place where people can actually learn about urban agriculture, but also simply be in nature and enjoy themselves. Um, and then we can see how this can also be done on the buildings. Uh, for instance, we can think about facades that have hydroponics on them and uh, have um, are cultivated with ornamental plants, again, for the well-being of the, the dwellers. And then uh, roofs that are actually can actually be transformed into, again, growing spaces where the communities within the building can actually meet and interact, but also grow their own food. So you can see how there are there is plenty of possibilities. And then um, again, the idea of the circular economy is actually to have the, the surplus or some of the produce to actually get shipped back to, and you can see it here in the blue line, to the, to the processing area, the, the AD that has also features of, uh, as serves also as an interface where people can actually uh, have a, lit, a, a small cup of coffee or otherwise uh, buy some food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the idea is actually to um, use the food waste, um, transform it, store it, possibly, and then reutilize it, um, grow food from it, and either consume it on site or otherwise send it back and sell it through an interface. And uh, so this is the main, uh, the point where we're at. Um, these are just the scenarios at a bigger scale. So this is just for you to see the nice green lines. <laughs> and um, yes, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valentina. Uh, thank you for bringing us a little bit in Colombia by telling us this, this uh, project's initiatives or about the urban agriculture in Bogota. Looks like you will have a really exciting next year. <laughs> and um, about this um, pilot circular, um, free, um, circular bio economy project, I didn't really understand if it is already implemented or what is the time framework for this project? So, um... The idea is to, we used as a case study, um, the area of Tavio. So uh, this area is going to be um, refurbished, reorganized, reconstructed because of um, uh, interventions in, in the neighborhood of Tower Hamlets. And the local um, housing association said, why don't you try to develop, to propose something to the local stakeholders, such as um, LEAP, that is the um, company we're collaborating with. So the idea is to um, visualize, to plan a whole um, food waste collection system and uh, use Taviat as a case study, but then develop a methodology that can be reutilized, of course adapted, but it, it is valuable for all the in those instances in London where you have um, renovation of social housing estates and you have you are faced with this problem or this opportunity of creating a, a more sustainable circular food waste um, at a reutilization system okay understand thank you um we're a little bit running out of time but i think we can have some debates uh, are there any questions to valentina Uh, yeah, um, just a, a quick question. Um, um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's uh, very interesting to really see uh, how the you, um, uh, your PhD is really applied on a specific uh, uh, site. I was wondering about the participative process that you um, that you're working with. And uh, if on the, the, the site that you mentioned, uh, if there are the people 
for taking care of this uh, uh, agriculture uh, uh, productivity? Um, so thanks for your question, that is. Um, so uh, community participation is essential for the implementation of successful, uh, successful um, models of collection, anything that you know, implies a change within a community uh, has to be approved and um, somehow the community has to be on board. Uh, so at this present time, um, the community, this was, uh, of course, uh, um, let's say an ideal uh, test. We're trying to develop a methodology. So we didn't have that much time to fully engage with the community because of course, a full engagement would require a year or so and we only have four months. So unfortunately um, that uh, was just done in a smaller but significant uh, occasion. And um, in terms of management, um, we've been debating about this um, long time. So in a sense, there are different possible scenarios um, that would uh, imply either that the community completely takes care of uh, their collection system or otherwise that there is a cooperative that comes in and helps them with the work or otherwise that is completely um, given uh, in control of again the the borrow so the the let's say the authority that is above the area of poplar so which would be tower hamlets um, from literature review, um, in general, it says that uh, management should be given to a th third party. It is not necessarily the city, but it has to be someone that controls it. Because um, otherwise, of course, like people can be on board, but they cannot be in charge of the logistics. Um, completely. So an interesting observation of one of the participants of the workshop was, uh, as I was pointing out, that um, more than, you know, uh, food waste uh, that is yucky, that, you know, uh, is um, not aesthetically pleasing, or, uh, you know, the, the, the hardships of uh, uh, moving away around soil, etc., the thing that they're really missing and they wish they had in their community, uh, so something that they would uh, want from the housing association, is actually the um, uh, backbone of initiatives where they can actually plug in with their own idea and they can uh, develop it and nurture it. But in a way, again, we're going back to this idea that there has to be a framework a stronger backbone that supports individuals. So I think that um, although everything is possible, the most feasible option is actually to have this mixed solution where you have citizens that will comply to uh, schedule a framework that is given by a third party and then possibly they can expand with their projects with their small um, intervention, whatever they want to develop, and then something can grow from that. Thanks.